Well, good morning, Freedom Church. How are you doing, Bel Air? Come on, help us welcome our Rising Sun campus, Nairobi, and our online campus. How many of you love that little bump right there? Eric Sarlo just biting the dust. That's good stuff. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm part of our pastoral team. And Did Pastor Joey not just burn the campus down last weekend? How many of you just... So good. Uh, we're kicking off a brand new series today called Living the Dream. Maybe you heard that phrase at work when someone was not living the dream, and they're like, what do you, how are you doing? Living the dream. We want to talk to you about actually living the dream that God has for you. And how many of you would just say you actually believe that God wants something for you that is more fulfilling, that is more abundant, that is, that is actually a better plan and dream than you could come up with yourself? That's what he wants for you. Um, but we've got to be careful over the next couple weeks. We're going to talk about some things that can get us distracted and get us off track because if we let culture define what the dream is, we can give our life and our energy and the best of who we are in, into the wrong things that we actually think is a dream. Then we go to cash in on it and we realize how empty it really is. How many of you know we've got to be careful who we let define the dream in our lives, right? And so actually tonight at Sunday Night Church, I'm going to be teaching on some things that will help you unpack God's dream for your life. And I was Super excited when I heard that this topic was on Pastor Wade's heart, and then when he was sharing that we got to talk about some of the obstacles that keep us from the dream, I'm like, oh, crap, this is going to be hard, because these, 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 these topics are not, every, not always the things that we want to talk about, because often when we say we're pursuing the dream, what we're actually doing is we're chasing carrots. We're chasing things that we think will fulfill us that God never intended for us. And I pray that today we can, we can get back on track with a couple of things related to the dream. I want to talk to you. The message is called the fame factor. The fame factor. And, and honestly, we've got to be real with each other. We live in a time in history unlike any other time before. Like humans have always had the desire for greatness in their heart and, and, and to be famous to some degree. But we have never lived in a time ever before where so many people have wanted to be seen, known, visible, affirmed, recognized all at the same time. Are you with me? Like, I hope that the history books don't look back on our time and say, wow, there's never been so many narcissists alive on the planet at the same time. Like, this is a real thing. So, like, parents, if, if you don't think it's a thing, let me tell you there's a study that was just done with uh, 10 to 12-year-olds. Asking them, what is the greatest ambition of your life? Basically, what do you want to get out of life more than anything? Uh, making money was not number one. Although, how many of you know your, your middle schooler is shocked when they go by, or their high schooler is shocked when they go by a jobs fair, and being a YouTube millionaire influencer is not one of the cubicles, not one of the options. They're like shocked, right? So making money was not number one. Health was not number one. Meaningful relationships was not number one. The number one answer 10 and 12-year-olds said is that they wanted to be famous. They wanted to be known. They wanted to be widely known. They, even if it means you've got to climb up on 500 milk crates and do something stupid, if you could get in a viral video, that somehow that, that would satisfy part of the dream for your life. How many of you know there's, there's a lot more to life than that? Uh, but we live in crazy times. Like several years ago, there was a guy named Alex, a 16-year-old in Texas, normal 16-year-old kid, like liked cars, got in trouble for having a messy room. On the weekends, he was a cashier at Target. One day, a girl going through the line with her phone just snaps a picture and says, oh, he's hot, and posts it online. That day when he went to work, he started his shift. He had 144 followers online. At the end of the day, he had almost 400,000 followers online. The next day, he was on CNN being interviewed for this explosion of just online exposure. Uh, he quickly got off all social media and was like, I'll take my life back. Thank you very much. How many of you know if you start living a dream that's not connected to God's dream, it can become a nightmare real quick, right? We live in crazy times. The fame, the fame factor is a, is a real thing. Now, before you think we're just picking on the teenagers and the the 10 and 12 year olds, if, if you're between the ages of 22 and 37, just wave at me, 22 and 37, Rising Sun Campus, wave, come on, 32 and 27, 22 and 37, this is one of those preacher setups, I'm just warning you in advance, okay, this is not going to end well for you, <laughs> if you, there was a study done recently, 22 to 37 year olds, watch this, 
50% believe that their life should be made into a movie. You can laugh harder than that. That's crazy. <laughs> like, we're not coming to your movie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Like, maybe we'll go watch Batman, but, like, your life is not on that level. This is crazy. The, the desire for fame is such a crazy, deceptive, like, sneaky thing in our hearts. It promises you so much, but often it costs you so much more. And if you don't want to listen to Pastor Josh and uh, you may struggle listening to, to what Jesus said. Take a lesson from Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, some of you don't know his backstory before he made his millions and became a, a, a famous comedian and movie star. He grew up living in a Volkswagen van. Like he was the OG of the guy living down in a van by the river. He, he, his, this Volkswagen van was on his relative's property, and his whole family for a period of time lived in this van. They were incredibly poor. They were so poor, they, they weren't even, uh, even poor, they were, they were poor. Like, when, you, when you're not even poor enough to be poor, they were broke. And he said to himself at 10 years old, he said, I am not going to live my life this way. I'm not going to follow in this poverty mentality. Do, do you know that God actually puts the dream for greatness inside of your heart? The enemy tries to distort it. The world tries to define But God put the desire in you to want to be great, to step out and live a dream. Jesus said, listen, let your light shine because when you are great, my Father gets more glorified. Amen? So God put that in you. But the enemy wants to try to mess with it. So, so Jim Carrey, at 10 years old, writes out a resume and sends it to the Carol Burnett show. Carol Burnett was an older comedian, a female comedian that just was... A huge platform, making millions laugh, making all kinds of money. He sends in his resume. It doesn't really get very far. But years later, he finds himself living in L.A. And like a starving artist, like most people that live in L.A. And he was really struggling to, to make ends meet. Wasn't getting any breakthrough. He said he drove his old Toyota Camry to the top of this hill overlooking the city in L.A. And just was staring at the lights and was trying to protect the dream that was in his heart. And he, and he wrote himself a check. For the young people, that's a piece of paper that used to be exchanged in money before Venmo and everything else. Jim Carrey, listen, he, 1992, writes himself a check for $10 million. And, and writes on the check for services rendered. And then he dates the check Thanksgiving 1995. And he said, over the next three years, someone is going to pay me for my skills, $10 million. And wouldn't you know, he was on the Oprah Winfrey show. And in 1995, after his role in Dumb and Dumber, they paid him $10 million for services rendered within the time frame he had for his dream. Come on, how many of you know when you begin to dream and you're willing to sacrifice and you're willing to get clear on what you re really want, it will begin to happen? The only problem is you've got to be careful as to what kind of dream you give your life to. Because later, after all of his millions and all of his awards and all of the publicity, this is what Jim Carrey had to say to us. He said, I hope everybody could get rich and famous and will have everything they've ever dreamed of so that they will know it is not the answer. The fame factor. The fame factor. It's... it's it's, it's a real thing. We live in a culture that is living for the like. It's, it's in the human condition. And I know some of you are like, listen, Josh, I, you wouldn't say you're beyond it or above it, but basically you're, you're like, I don't want to be famous. Like, I just want to live my life in peace and quiet. I want all these crazy people to leave me alone, and I just want to live my life. I don't want to be famous. Like, I totally get that. In fact, I love the, the meme that says, how do introverts make friends? They don't. They, they have an extrovert that likes them, adopts them, and pulls them into their relational world and introduces them to a ton of friends. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, some of you two years ago during COVID, you realized that your normal lifestyle is actually scientifically defined as quarantined. <laughs> You're like, I like it that way. Don't try to rehabilitate me. I'm good. Even if you would say, I have no desire to be famous at that level... There's still in the human condition a desire to be seen, known, appreciated. And, and what I would say is a micro craving of fame. This is, this is all of us, introverts and extroverts alike. Uh, this can show up where maybe you overcommit and you take on too much because 
you just hate disappointing people. The truth is you're trying to uphold an image, and you don't want people upset with you. It's, it's a micro craving for fame. Uh, you haven't learned that no is a complete sentence. What? Because you don't want to disappoint people. It could be that you're crushed by even the smallest form of correction or criticism. It's a micro craving for fame. Uh, maybe at work, you, you don't mind working hard. You get there early. You do your job. But if you do something, you want the recognition and the credit for doing it. And when someone takes credit for something you do, you, 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 something inside of you happens. And you're like, I didn't even know that was in there. Well, that's a micro craving for fame. Maybe you've got a, a great sense of humor, a gift for making people laugh, maybe not at the $10 million check level. But maybe you're in a situation and you could say something that would be borderline inappropriate, but, and it may even hurt someone's feelings, but you do it anyways to get the laugh. That's a micro craving for fame in that moment. Or, or the common one where we sometimes out of insecurity... We, we don't even realize sometimes that we're trying to portray uh, a, a life in an image where if you allow it to, insecurity can turn the people in your life into props in your life. So this is where I'll never forget we'd be having family moments and I'd pull out my phone to take a picture to prove to you that I loved my wife and I had cool kids and we were on a vacation. And my boys would just roll their eyes and be like, Dad, put your phone away. And you can find yourself posting more than you are present. And the people you love more than anything in this world no longer are people. They're just props to show the world that you are something. This is, this is all around us, right? This is, this is a big deal. We are all affected by it in different ways and in varying degrees. But before we look at Jesus and how to fix some of this, I just have to give a disclaimer. Not all fame is actually a bad thing. God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. He said, I didn't ask for it. You didn't ask for it, but I'm going to make you great because out of the overflow of that, I'm going to get glory when people see your greatness, Abraham. Solomon, I'm going to make you so wise and so wealthy that kings and queens from around the world are going to come just to see your kingdom and to sit at your feet. He didn't ask necessarily for that, but God gave it to him. How many of you know God's favor can create fame on your life? We just need to know how to handle it. Uh, David, look at this verse here in Chronicles. It says, so David did as God commanded, which aren't you thankful that blessing follows obedience, right? David did as God commanded and struck down the Philistine army all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. Watch this. So David's fame spread throughout every land, and the Lord made all the nations fear him, honor him, respect him. So Biblically, you could actually make a case that God made David famous. So not all fame is bad. In fact, I would say to you, hone your craft. Like, elevate your gifts. Be, be the, put in your 10,000 hours to become an expert at something that you're passionate about. Like, do the best you can to give God glory. Jesus said, what? Let your light shine. He is not afraid of you being great in an area of your life. In fact, you can never outdream God with the bigness and the things that he has planned for you. Right? So, so get good. But when you do, just remember that your status is always about his purpose. And the favor on you isn't even for you. It's for the people around you so that you can serve them. Come on, somebody. Like, if you want to protect the influence and the favor that God gives you, I'll tell you what, when you receive something in your life by favor, you protect it through humble gratitude. If you received it by favor, that's how you protect it, by honoring God. If you had to scrape and claw and grab your way to get it, then guess what you need to do to keep it? You've got to scrape and grind and grab your way to keep it. That's an exhausting life. Jesus says, I have none of that. I don't, that's not the dream that I have for you. So what feeds this fame factor in our culture? And maybe like, let's not keep it at a safe distance in culture. What, what feeds this in us, not just out there? I love this quote from John Maxwell. He says, we live in a culture obsessed with showing thyself instead of knowing thyself. Pause and think about that. that that's a major statement. Look, look at this next one. Let's break down the components of what we have here. We've got social media says, I show myself. Now, by the way, social media is such a powerful tool 
when it's used the right way. But here's the deal. If you need something from them so bad, you're not in the position to serve them what they need. If you need something so bad, you can't serve them. So use it as the powerful tool that it is. But social media, by and large, for a lot of us is I show myself. Self-awareness is I know myself. Self-leadership is I actually begin to lead myself. How many of you know if you don't have self-awareness, you can't even lead yourself? Pastor Wade's been talking to our team a lot about humility and self-awareness. And Aristotle, the philosopher, said that every human being, the phrase he used, he said they have a fatal flaw. The fatal flaw is something that's hidden in your blind spot that you're not aware of but other people are aware of. And Aristotle said that if a person were to address their fatal flaw and get help in that area, it would drastically change their entire lives. So self-aware, how many of you know we need the Holy Spirit to show us? Come on, I need to get into the mirror of God's word. I need to say, I am who you say that I am, right? Self-leadership, and the whole goal is servant leadership. Jesus said, yeah, I know who I am, and I'm going to manage myself, and I'm going to leverage my entire life, the dream of God, to serve others. So I want to give you three things out of the life of Jesus to help deal with this fame factor, and it's going to come from John 13. This is the last few days, the last several hours of Jesus' life. John 13, verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him. Now, in today's language, we'd be like, this is my moment. The hour has come. Like, this is, the curtains are opening. This is my moment. This was not that kind of moment for Jesus. This was not the kind of moment where he was going to try to draw more followers from a spiritually blind world who had a completely different value system than him. This was not the kind of moment to make it about him, even though he had hours left on the planet. The Bible says that his brothers at one point tried to be like his campaign managers. And they're like, Jesus, if you want to be somebody and you want to be known, you've got to like, get out of Judea, get out of Galilee, and go to Jerusalem. Show yourself at the feast. And he said to his brothers, he said, listen, any time is good for you to do that. He said, but my times are in my Father's hands. How many are thankful that your times and your... David said, God, my season, my promotion, my favor, my life, my dream is in your hands. And Jesus was not going to be moved. The hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to his father. He says, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm honoring the father. And I love that for Jesus, he, he's, he's pursuing the dream that the father had for him, but he was not going to get tripped up at the finish line over this, this fame factor. He's at, he's, at, he's at the last supper and the disciples are arguing with each other, who is going to be the greatest? Who's going to have the biggest platform? Who's going to sit at his right hand? Who's going to be? And Jesus is like, you have no idea. I've been serving you for three years. And now by the spirit of God, he's telling me to go lower still. W what would it be like in your life if the Holy Spirit just, just encouraged you in a relationship or to go lower still? Lower still. Like, What would that look like in your marriage? What would that look like in your relationships? What would that look like in how you serve people? Lower still. Jesus was completely fulfilling the dream of God that his father gave him, and he was leveraging everything for others. The first fame factor I want to give you, I'm going to give you three. The first is this. I want you to ask the Lord, how do we become famous with the right people? How do you become famous with the right people? Look what it says in John 13. It says, and Jesus loved his own. The, the meal was progressing. There you go. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end or showed the full extent of his love. That phrase right there, I just want to leave that with you. He loved his own. Now, did Jesus love the entire world? Absolutely. But he gave his best to those who were closest. He loved his own. He loved his disciples. What would happen if you and I intentionally decided that we were going to leverage our best energy and, and the best of our life for the people that we know instead of becoming known with the people that are far out there that we don't know. Like what would actually happen if we were like, you know what, I'm going to love my own. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love my own like nobody's business because it says that Jesus knew what the Father was doing. He wasn't obsessed with becoming known. He, he was going to love his own. He was going to love the closest, the best. 
Uh, this next picture here, some of you may know who this is. This is uh, Dr. John Maxwell. For 25 years, he was a pastor. After pastoring, um, he began to lead businesses. Um, he's discipling presidents. You, you know you've got a pretty good skill set for coaching when the Pope calls you as a client for coaching. Um, he's, he has, the Pope needs some help. Let's just pray for the Pope. Um, John has published over 100 books, sold over 30 million copies. In some circles, he's very well known. His birthday was a couple weeks ago, and he turned 75. And on February 20th, they announced that they were adding a new day to the calendar, National Leadership Day, in honor of John Maxwell's birthday. The guy's not even dead, and they're naming days of the calendar after his influence, right? Pretty cool. That wasn't the best part of his birthday. His wife, Margaret, who's normally like way behind the scenes, she gets up at his birthday and just says, you know, the man that you think he is, is the man he really is. Come on, how many of you know that's the stuff that you live and die for? When the people closest to you think the most of you, when you know something about your God-given value and your God-given call that you say, you know what, I'm going to love my own and not try to become known to the rest of the world. I love it. I love it. That's exactly what Jesus did. We've got to become famous with the right people. Uh, Verse 2, it says this. It says, the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas Can I just tell you that the the devil is so scared of you stepping into the dream of God for your life. Like, he's absolutely terrified. He he wants to resist it. He wants to lie to you. He wants to build coalitions against you. But aren't you so thankful that this train can't be stopped? He didn't vote it in. He can't stop it. It's the dream of God for your life. He can bring any kind of attack he wants. But as the dream of God was progressing for Jesus... The enemy is prompting Judas to betray him and to mess it up. And watch, it, watch Jesus' response. It says, and Jesus knew. Again, he's not fixated on trying to become known. He's, he's living out of the overflow of what he knows and his identity. That the Father had put all things under his power. That's a lot of authority. And that he had come from God, from heaven. And that he was returning to God in heaven. I love this about Jesus. Jesus just says... I know who I am, and therefore I can serve people at another level. When I don't need something from you, listen to me, you've got to get this rising sun, lean in. It's great to get from people appreciation. But how many of you know I can only get my validation from the Most High God? Like, I can get appreciation from people, but I cannot get the deep level validation we need any other place. Jesus said, I know where I came from, I know what I'm here to do, and I know where I'm going. Talk about living the dream of God, and he was living it in a way that served other people. And can I just encourage you, just because there may not be a camera on you, just because somebody may not be seeing you or recording you, in God's mind, there is no such thing as small obedience. It all registers in heaven. He sees it all, and the way earth weighs it on our scale is dramatically different than in the kingdom of God. Jesus is teaching us not only to be famous with the right people, but to be famous in the right places. He didn't say it like this. And honestly, when people say stuff like, you know, where I'm from, I'm kind of a big deal. And then you throw up on their shoes. (laughs) Jesus could have said, where I'm from, I'm kind of a big deal. Like in heaven, I'm I'm a pretty big deal. Here's the key to, to stepping into the dream of God for your life. Focus on being famous with the right people and focus on being famous in the right places. He said, my weight, my influence, my value in heaven, earth is trying to catch up to the way heaven already sees me. And I love this about the Apostle Paul, too, in the book of Acts. It says that Paul, Paul was, Paul was infamous more than even famous. Infamous is just you're famous for something bad. Like, he was infamous with religious leaders that wanted to kill him. He was infamous with government leaders. He was even infamous with some Christians in the church. And yet, the Bible says when someone needed to have a demon cast out of them, the evil spirit spoke through the person to to the person trying to do the exorcism and said, listen, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who the heck are you? Like, in other words... (laughs) 
Paul is known in heaven and feared in hell. Earth doesn't quite know what to do with him, but he is known in the right place. Jesus was known in the right places. Paul was known in the right places. How many of you know when you are famous in the right place, it changes the way you put expectations on people in this life? We've got to stop asking people for questions they could never answer. They can't tell you your value because they didn't create you. They didn't come up with your calling. They weren't there when God knit you together in your mother's womb. They didn't have a say or a vote. So stop asking them for answers that they don't carry. Jesus said, I know where I came from, and I know what I'm doing, and I know where I'm going. And he says, oh, by the way, as the Father has loved me, he still loves you. Heaven knows your name. Paul was known in heaven and feared in hell. I, I love that. So here Jesus is. He's famous with the right people. He's famous in the right places. And, and the result is he lowers himself to serve. Look at John 13. It says, so he got up from the meal. Can you imagine? You know you're about to, your life is over and your closest friends are arguing about who's going to be the most popular. And still... He took off the outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Because Jesus knew, I'm not just representing me, I'm representing my Father. Even if you don't even know what I'm doing for you, I'm still going to do it because I'm living under the smile of heaven and the pleasure and approval of my Father. Can I just say, that's a dangerous person. That's somebody that's going to do the will of God and say, World, you sort it out. <laughs> it's already sorted out up there. Can you imagine the confidence that could be unleashed in your heart if you just knew you're like, I know where I came from, I know who I am, and I know where I'm going. And it's not an arrogance. It's so clothed in a humility that says, actually, I'm not too big of a deal to lower myself and serve you. Amazing. Is th would that not be attractive in any family or any business or any situation? Incredible. When we become secure in our own skin, when we choose to be famous with the right people, famous in the right places, things begin to happen. You, you stop asking questions like, do I matter? Am I seen? Am I visible? And, and the questions internally in your self-talk begin to change. The questions begin to be more like, where can I add value? Who needs someone to have them listen to? Um, how, how can I, is there somebody that needs to borrow my strength? Is there, is there somebody that I could tip? Is there someone I can invest in? Your, your questions change because you're coming from a place of being resourced. You're like, I appreciate the encouragement. I appreciate the affirmation. But I only go to one place for my validation. So therefore, out of the overflow, I can go lower still. Jesus, it's, he said, listen. Follow my example. This is, this is the way you live the dream. So Freedom Church, living the dream is less about my recognition. It's more about his name. It's less about see me, follow me. It's more about pursue him, know him. Come on, Freedom Church. It's less about, it's less about my attention. It's more about his glory. And not only do you become comfortable with it, you crave it because you're like, if you only knew him like I know him. If you Listen, I'm not denying that this area of my life is great, but if you only know who made it great. Like, we're not embracing some kind of false humility. That's, that's garbage. Like, that has no place in the body of Christ. But, it got really quiet. <laughs> let, let me just say, um, in, in, my, in my own heart, and the worship team, you can come. This was a big deal for God to continually work out in my life. I grew up in a great family. And I've told you before, we had six kids. So it was a good day if, if my mom and dad even remembered my name. Because it was like, you know, like they'd give, go through like four names and then they'd get to you. Um, but somehow along the way, I believed the lie that I wasn't visible unless I did something amazing. Like really good or really bad, that was the only way I was going to get attention and so I had to excel in school, excel in sports, and any other way. And along the way, I believed a lie about what the dream of God was for my life. And so I'm telling you, this, this, this can distort some things. So now when I have an opportunity to publish a book or to walk through an open door or accept an invitation or I see a measure of favor or a, a measure of influence, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm praying constantly saying, God, 
Help my heart not to do this to be impressive. Help it to be from a heart wanting to make an impact. Like this is the fame factor that tries to creep in. And so the last one, we want to be famous with the right people. We want to be famous in the right places. You've got to know that you are known in heaven. And the last one, number three, we've got to become confident that you have always been seen and always been known and always been loved by God. The world may not have known what to do with you, but you weren't a mistake. And sometimes when we are looking for approval from people instead of living from a place of approval from from God, God will drop someone in your life to help show you what that looks like. And there was a there was a guy, I showed you a picture of John Maxwell. Some of you knew who he was. Showed you a quote from Jim Carrey. A lot of you knew who he was. This this next picture right here, Stacy and Connie Klein, probably none of you know who they are. But to me, they were famous. Um, Stacy didn't grow up in a good home. In fact, uh, as a young man, he was a bouncer. That's how he made his living. Getting into fights all the time, and, and he was a he's a big man and was pretty rough. In his 20s, he gave his life to Christ and then became a Bible college professor. The youngest professor in the history of the school that I went to. And he served as a Bible college professor for almost 50 years. Anna and I took classes, marriage and the family. He was, he was like my favorite Bible teacher. And Stacy became a friend. He was a mentor. In some crazy turn of events, at 27 years old, I became a lead pastor in Rochester, New York. And he joined our church. So now my mentor, I'm like his pastor, and I'm like, what is going on with this? And Stacy didn't just teach us the Bible. He taught us from his life. And he became so secure in the love of God that his dream was literally just helping everyone around him discover their dream. That's the way he lived his life. And he, he preached, and he taught, and he influenced thousands, but... He showed us with his life, he showed us what it looked like to embrace suffering on the path of the dream of God. When his daughter Renee was in her 20s, she was deathly allergic to shellfish. She was at Regent University in Virginia at a banquet with about 1,200 other people from the college. Her husband was working at the college, and she started showing signs of an allergic reaction, and they rushed her to the hospital. And they had thousands of people mobilized to pray within within such a short time. But not only did Renee die of that allergic reaction, but the child she was carrying died in her womb, and that was Stacy and Connie's first grandchild. So we watched them go through suffering. Then when Stacy was so depressed and so upset and he couldn't sleep at night, he started drinking himself to sleep. So he's living one life as a Bible teacher and then drinking himself to sleep. And then he had the courage to come out and say, hey, I have a problem. I need to get some help. You know how much courage that takes? Just showed us. He said, I I know God loves me, and I know that we'll sort this out, but I need to get help. And he did get help. It was an incredible example to us. Then years later, his wife, Connie, developed early onset dementia and Alzheimer's. She was way too young to go through that. He took care of her at home by himself. He would teach during the day and then go home and take care of her around the clock and then finally needed to put her in a facility. And he would go visit her every day. I'll never forget the conversation. He said, Josh, I went to go visit Connie and I'm holding her hand and just kind of rubbing her arm and I could tell that she's upset. And I say, sweetie, what's wrong? And she looks at me and she says, Stacy never comes to see me anymore. She had forgotten who he was. And he's telling me with tears, he said, I just love that woman. And, and people were asking Stacy, how do you do what you do? Like, how do you keep serving people? And he said this, he said, I choose to love Jesus. I choose to be grateful. And I choose to serve others. He said to me, there were some women that approached him after Connie had died. And, and there was nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with remarrying. But he wanted to be really clear with these women. And so he said, I, I, ha- I just have to tell you, I have three things to tell you. I'm not over my wife. I don't want to be over my wife. And I'll never be over my wife. He said, I don't want to mislead your heart. I hope I was clear. And they were like, abundantly. <laughs> he showed me not only how to suffer in the dream of God, but how, what it looks like for a man to love a woman. 
not that long ago, Casey, uh, Stacy was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. And his doctor was talking to him. His family doctor knew his whole history. And he, he, even his doctor said to him, Stacy, isn't there a guy in the Bible named Job? Like, what's happening? How can you love God when all these things happen to you? And he began to talk to his doctor about loving Jesus and holding on to him in the midst of every season of the dream. And I just got a nudge this Tuesday morning just to reach out because I knew he had been very sick. He was released from the hospital and brought home for hospice care. And I asked a friend who was caring for him, like, could I just send a video text? Is he conscious? Could I just get a message to him? And uh, while I was on my way to the Bel Air campus, my friend called me on FaceTime in a video and he said, hey, Stacy, we'd love to just talk to you. And it was his last few sentences. He barely had enough strength to talk. And he just said, Pastor, would you bless me? I'm thinking, bless you. You have defined for me what it looks like to serve other people despite whatever else is going on in your life. And this Friday at noon, Stacy stepped into eternity to receive his inheritance. And can I just tell you, as sad as I was for us and all the people that loved him and as little as people know him and how little fame he has, can I just say his reward in heaven is so massive. His reunion with his wife, his reunion with his daughter, he was famous with the right people. He was famous in the right places. He knew that he was deeply loved. Jesus said, I know where I've come from. I know what I'm doing, and I know where I'm going. Come on, would you stand to your feet with me, Bel Air? Rising sun, would you stand? Freedom Church, what would happen if we flipped the script on fame? What would happen if you pursued the dream of God with everything you had? What would happen if we became so convinced that we could become famous in the right way with the right people? What what if... The world, come on, never knows your name. But you and I, we know a name that is above every name. He's the first and the last. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the soon coming King. He's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He's the one that wrote your dream. He's the one that empowers your dream. He's the one cheering you on saying, I know your name because I wrote it in the palm of my hand. You're famous in heaven and you are known by your heavenly Father. Would you bow your heads all across this room? I know you have a dream inside of you. I don't know how clear you are on it. I don't know if you know the cost it's going to take to walk that out. But I do know that it's better than you think. It fits you. It suits you. It was made for you. It was custom made by your heavenly father. And some of you are still even working through what that relationship looks like with him. It doesn't matter. You have a dream inside of you. And right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your activity. Thank you for softening hearts. Thank you for making us courageous in your love. And so right now, God, I pray for myself and for my friends. I thank you that you see us, that you know us, that you've called us, that you've chosen us. That when we find ourselves, God, reaching for love and reaching for affirmation, I pray we would pivot and just begin to receive incredible validation from you. That as we step into the dream that you have for our lives, that we would give you glory. God, I pray you take our giftings, you would take our ambition as we lay it at your feet. I pray you take our abilities. I pray that you take our net worth. I pray that you take our relationships. Take them to another level of greatness so that you would receive another level of glory. God, we ask that you would baptize us in supernatural humility and self-awareness, that we would be your hands and your feet, your body to those closest to us, God, that we would serve them so well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, Freedom Church, can we just give our hands, give a clap for the call of God, the dream of God.